دولت ہے دیگر کس کو خوب است بر شازاتی آمده که میگم ما خوش هستیم بر ما شای و روز ما به غم است A world away in New York. This is Rita Lazar and her brother Abe. Abe was killed in the Twin Towers on September the 11th. He might have saved himself, but chose to help a disabled friend. My view does not look out on the World Trade Center, but I'm on the 15th floor in Lower Manhattan, and I ran across the hall to my friend's apartment and her windows looked out on the World Trade Center and I got there in time to see the second plane hit the second building. And strangely enough, it was only then that I said, oh my God, my brother's in that building. Danny, my son's best friend, called and said, can I come over? And we said, sure. And he said, did you watch the president's speech? And we said, no. And he said, he mentioned your brother. And I looked at him and I said, what are you talking about? And then I thought, gee, there must have been a lot of people who stayed behind with their friends in wheelchairs. You know, you don't think that it's your own brother. You it just, you don't think that. But it was my brother. And immediately, immediately I knew that my country was going to use my brother's death to justify killing innocent people in Afghanistan and wherever else they would look. Rita decided to go to Afghanistan to comfort the victims of the American bombing. She met Orifa and took her to the American embassy in Kabul to seek compensation for the killing of her family. I'll tell you about Arifa. She had taken a translated description of what had happened to her and her family to the American Embassy to ask for help and had been turned away and told, go away, you're a beggar. The oppressed people of Afghanistan will know the generosity of America and our allies. As we strike military targets, we will also drop food, medicine, and supplies to the starving and suffering men and women and children of Afghanistan. The United States of America is a friend to the Afghan people. Such a friend that out of $10 billion spent in Afghanistan in the last two years, the majority has been spent on the military. Of all the great humanitarian disasters, few countries have been helped less than Afghanistan. Only 3% of all international aid has been for reconstruction. Such a friend that the United States has yet to clear these unexploded cluster bombs it dropped in the center of Kabul, where children play in the lethal rubble. And children are supposed to learn in this devastation. The Afghan government gets less than 20% of the aid that is delivered. Omar Zakawal is a government official in Kabul. Well, 20% is about 300 million. 300 million? You're meant to rebuild the country, basically, with 300 million. Oh, no. The government does not have its, its own resources for the um, ordinary budget. The 300 million become salaries and electricity and those. No, those are not for reconstruction. That sounds like you're left with almost nothing. Then. The government has no money for reconstruction, period. Thank you, Mr. 
The water in this typical Afghan village may look clean, but it's contaminated, and most of the children suffer from preventable diseases. Since the overthrow of the Taliban, little has changed. For these people, life is just as dangerous. I found the population of two villages living destitute in the rubble of this shoe factory in Kabul. They'd fled attacks by warlords who'd robbed them and kidnapped their wives and daughters. I've spent much of my life in places of upheaval but I've rarely seen such a bombed and blasted and ruined city as Kabul. Most of the damage was done not by the Taliban, but by the Afghan warlords backed and trained and funded by America for more than 20 years. The same warlords who have been effectively put back into power by George Bush. While Afghanistan's liberation from the Taliban was welcomed here and brought certain freedoms, such as the opening of schools and the playing of music. For many people, another kind of terror replaced it, one barely acknowledged in the West. And not only has the government in Kabul no power and no money, the president, Hamid Karzai, dares not leave his office without his 42 bodyguards from the US Special Forces. Real power is held by these men, warlords, whose record of repression and brutality is little different from the Taliban. Many Afghans regard them as no better. For four years from 1992, they fought each other for control of Kabul, killing 50,000 innocent people and smashing the city to rubble. By any definition, the warlords are terrorists, bribed by the Americans with a fortune in cash and truckloads of arms. Today, they control the government in Kabul and have re-established the opium trade, from which comes most of the heroin reaching the streets of Britain. Now Human Rights Watch has broken the silence, documenting atrocities committed by gunmen and warlords who have essentially hijacked the country. Once again, the victims are often women. Today, women are free and are part of Afghanistan's new government. And we welcome the new Minister of Women's Affairs, Dr. Seema Sumar. Dr. Seema Sumar is a symbol of Afghan resistance and humanity. She defied the Taliban and ran clinics for women. In 2001, she and another woman were appointed to the new government as the face of liberation. But no sooner had the applause in Washington died away than she was forced out. The warlords were not tolerating such an outspoken voice of freedom for women. Today, Dr. Samar lives in constant fear of her life with bodyguards with her night and day. No one understands more the plight of Afghan women. It's not much change for them. They're still, the majority doesn't have access to health care. They don't have access to education. They don't have access to job opportunity. The liberation of women in Afghanistan is mostly a sham and their plight is desperate. Since the overthrow of the Taliban, Human Rights Watch has documented kidnapping and the mass rape of women, girls and boys. Girl schools have been burned down. In the western city of Herat, women can be arrested if they drive, and if they are caught with an unrelated man, even a taxi driver, they may be subjected to a chastity test. This is Marina, a member of an extraordinary organization called the Revolutionary Women of Afghanistan, which has protected and educated women and documented their repression we had to meet in secret. The veil was necessary to cover her identity. 
we don't believe that there is much difference between the Taliban and the Northern Alliance or the commanders who are now in power in different parts of Afghanistan because the origin is the same. They believe in the same thing. Their nature is the same. They are the two faces of the same coin. Women don't feel secure. Um, the police are generally not functioning properly. Courts are not generally functioning properly. You have places where you have real deep fear of commanders and of armed groups. You have cases where women get taken by armed groups, where people become imprisoned in private jails. You have reports that men and women who are walking down the street get picked up almost at random to check whether or not they're married, to verify that, that they haven't been having illegal sexual intercourse. Just um, a month back, these commanders raped women, and a group of 35 women jumped into the river along with their children, and they died just to save themselves from being raped again. The starving, the wretched, the dispossessed, the ignorant, those living in want and squalor, from the deserts of northern Africa to the slums of Gaza to the mountain regions of Afghanistan, they too are our cause. To a growing number of people around the world, America's war on terror is about hypocrisy and double standards, about terrorists classified as good and bad, depending on their usefulness to the great game of power politics. For years, Osama bin Laden was not only regarded in Washington and London as a good terrorist, he was virtually our creation. One of the most closely guarded secrets of the Cold War was America's role in supporting Afghan warlords known as the Mujahideen. The official story is that America backed these fundamentalists in response to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in December 1979. But that's not true. It was six months before the Soviet invasion, in July of that year, that President Jimmy Carter authorized $500 million to help set up the Mujahideen, a terrorist organization. The American people were completely unaware that their government, together with the British Secret Service, MI6, had begun training and funding Islamic extremists, including Osama bin Laden. Out of this came the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and September the 11th. Soon after the Taliban came to power in 1996, the administration of Bill Clinton backed a secret plan for a pipeline through Afghanistan from Central Asia, which has vast reserves of oil and gas. The Taliban were offered a generous cut in the deal and secretly invited to Washington and Texas. They were treated royally, taken shopping and flown to tourist attractions like the NASA Space Center and Mount Rushmore. Their tour was so secret that no television news covered it. Most Americans knew nothing. By the time George W. Bush came to power, the link between Al-Qaeda and the Taliban was an embarrassment, and September the 11th gave Bush an opportunity to get rid of them. Today, Afghanistan is run by a regime installed by the Americans, and the pipeline deal is going ahead. September the 11th also presented an opportunity to an influential group who even by Republican Party standards were extreme. Ray McGovern is a former senior officer of the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, and a personal friend of George Bush Sr., the president's father. The same people who are running US policy now are people that the president's father kept at arm's length. They were, they, they were referred to uh, in the circles in which I moved when I was briefing at the top intelligence and policy levels. They were referred to as the crazies. The crazies, I mean, you could talk about the crazies, everyone knew who they were. Richard Pearl, Paul Wolfowitz, Doug Feith, those folks. 
the crazies also include Donald Rumsfeld, seen here in Baghdad in 1986, warmly greeting Saddam Hussein, who was then being armed to the teeth by America and Britain. This is one of their blueprints, published in 2000 by the extreme right-wing group Project for a New American Century. The US military will fight multiple simultaneous wars as the cavalry on the new American frontier. The principal author is William Crystal. The problem with America is not that we go around marauding around the world imposing ourselves. Mm. The problem with America in the last 10, 15 years since the end of the Cold War, really in the last 60 years, is that we've been too slow to get involved mm. in mm. conflicts. Outside America, people have worried about uh, the United States uh, conducting an unprovoked attack on a country, a sovereign country. Whether are they? Or not, whether, are they? Yes, yes, they are. Really? They're yeah. worried we're going to attack Britain, France, no, Germany, no, no, any, no, any democracy? No, no, because... Any no, decent regime? No, the, well, no, the United States doesn't uh, usually attack strong countries. Do we attack decent countries? No, I said strong countries. Why well, asking decent countries? I don't know Are what people you really worried I, the U.S. is going I, to go, I, I, a decent law-abiding country, and the U.S. I, is going to come in and say, we don't like the look of you, we're going to depose you? Is that something the U.S. has done quite often? How uh, many countries has the U.S. attacked in uh, the there last been, 15 been, years? Uh, well, since World War II, there have been 72 interventions by the United States. Oh, is that right? Yes. That's ludicrous. Well, it's not ludicrous, it's true. These are some of the countries where the United States, directly and indirectly, has overthrown governments manipulated elections and attacked popular movements since 1945. Bush's war on terror is just another brand name replacing the Red Menace as justification for a systematic aggression. This is well documented, yet it remains a kind of secret history, seldom reported in the West as a war of terror. Take just one decade, the 1970s. September the 11th, 1973 is not an anniversary many of us remember. On that day, the United States helped engineer the overthrow of the democratic government of Chile. More than 30,000 people were killed, including the elected president, Salvador Allende. In Southeast Asia, American bombers killed hundreds of thousands in Cambodia and Laos. In Vietnam, the United States sprayed a chemical poison called Agent Orange, a weapon of mass destruction. Today, its effects still cause death and birth deformities. In Indonesia and East Timor, America's backing of the dictatorship of General Suharto led to as many as a million deaths. The U.S. government multiplied its aid to uh, uh, Indonesia as the slaughter uh, in, in East Timor was occurring. Um, Vietnam, <laughs> Cambodia, Laos. Um, you know, the United States ranks pretty high, unfortunately, in, uh, in supporting uh, uh, leaders and governments um, that brutalize their own people. Last year, the Bush administration released its national security strategy. Behind the jargon of the war on terror is a new message that America intends to stand alone and dominate by threat of force. It reminds you, I think, of the days of the 50s when people, children were told to go under their desks because an atomic bomb might hit them or something. I mean, it's just ludicrous what's going on. And the whole twist of dragging Iraq into the war of terrorism, the axis of evil, all of this fundamental sort of rubbish, you might say, is part of the political games that have been played by Bush, given the opportunity that 9-11 presented to him and his regime and the survival thereof and the future thereof uh, for the next election in 2004. Today, the United States has 152 military bases around the world. These include bases at major sources of energy established under cover of the war on terror the US military calls this full spectrum dominance. We don't really give a damn what anybody thinks. We rub everyone's face in it. We're Americans and you're not. And we're really, we're talking the Roman Empire here. I mean, we're, we, we'll do anything we want to do, anywhere we want to do it. Uh, and you're either with us or against us. 
and multilateral institutions like the UN are incidental and irrelevant uh, to the powers that be. That is the image we're sending to the world. That is what much of the world feels about this country right this minute. We cannot accept, and we will not accept, states that harbor, finance, train, or equip the agents of terror. Those nations that violate this principle will be regarded as hostile regimes. How ironic are Bush's words, because thousands of known terrorists are to be found in the United States living beyond the law. Last year, Amnesty International confirmed the presence of thousands of torturers given safe haven in the United States. The report listed notorious names from Latin America, many of them trained here at the School of Americas in the state of Georgia, where American officers used manuals like this to teach the black arts of terror and repression. Most Americans are completely unaware of this. You know, you looked at the Truth Commission report in El Salvador, who was responsible for the massacres. Very high percentage of them were trained in the United, at the School of the Americas in Georgia. Um, and down, not just in El Salvador, in Panama, in Honduras, uh, in Guatemala. Um, you go, as I have, um, you go and meet with you know, the high command in the, in the, of the military in Central America, and, and you see on their walls diplomas uh, from the School of Americas and other uh, U.S. institutions. So when people talk about terrorism, it's always over there. It's not the terrorists uh, that the United States have supported. We have done more uh, throughout our history, uh, and since World War II in particular, I think to create conditions in which individuals can be free around the world uh, than any other country in history. In Afghanistan, Colonel Rod Davis is helping to spread that message of individual freedom. Good morning, I'm Colonel Rod Davis. I'm the Director of Public Affairs for CJTF 180. That's the Coalition Military Force uh, stationed here in Afghanistan, specifically at Bagram Air Base. Uh, this morning, what we're going to do is take you on a tour of Bagram Air Base, and we're going to tour numerous facilities, the airfield itself, We'll this is Bagram Air Base near Kabul. It's here that Al-Qaeda suspects are interrogated and disappear, and where there have been allegations of torture. Many of them end up in Camp X-Ray at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. What happens, Colonel, to innocent people who are swept up in this? People who have come through your detention facility here at Bagram, but there really isn't a case to be made against them, and they've kind of disappeared. Well, let's talk about uh, what you okay. refer to as the detention facility. We'll hold right there, well, how, how allow you to you get describe, some images. How would you describe it if it's not a detention okay. facility? Okay. Tell you what, uh, we'll talk about that. Let's uh, pull off to the side here and let you take a few images. Oh, this is it over here, is it? Well, we'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What I can assure you and your public of is this. That anyone that's under custody, any of the holding locations, they're attended to medically. Medical care is provided. They're fed. They're looked after. There's no abuse or torture that goes on inside of any of these holding facilities. Well, there have been, there have been allegations of torture, haven't there? Uh, Particularly, there's, there's uh, a military pathologist who actually described the death in custody of a man here. I think his name was Delaware, who uh, she described it as homicide, murder. You know that case. I'm aware of uh, I'm aware of the allegation, and what I'll say to you is, I think anyone who's fair would have to say that Americans, in particular, but certainly members of the coalition. Uh, aren't known for committing atrocities. That's not something that's part of our history. It's not the way we do business. Uh, it's not the way we treat people. If you were arrested in the United States by a foreign army and brought to a holding facility, 
Wouldn't you expect to have certain basic rights, that is, access to lawyers, access to people outside, not just simply to literally disappear? Well, you, you talked about status before. And as I said, it's rather complicated. And I, I guess there's some type of continuum or spectrum, if you will. You know, probably prisoners of war off to the far left or right, depending on your perspective, and something less than that to the far other end. Um, we're somewhere on that spectrum. Yeah. Somewhere on that spectrum is this man. Wazir Muhammad is a Kabul taxi driver who disappeared into Bagram in April last year. He's now in Guantanamo Bay. He's not been charged with anything. His crime was to inquire after a friend, another taxi driver, who was arrested and who has since been released. What makes this case so appalling is that this man is recognized by the present government as having resisted the Taliban. This is his brother, Taj Muhammad, a nurse. This is where he is now, Guantanamo Bay, where prisoners are shackled, trussed, and kept in cages eight feet by seven feet for up to 24 hours a day. The light is always on. Children and old men have been incarcerated. Amnesty International calls it a black hole, a violation of the most basic human rights. There are nine British citizens here, including this man, Shafiq Rasul from the West Midlands, who was effectively kidnapped by the Americans two weeks after he'd arrived in Pakistan, where he has relatives. That was almost two years ago. Since then, his family has pleaded for help from the British government, but still, he's been charged with nothing. These are the oil fields of the Middle East, the greatest prize of all. Iraq is the world's second biggest oil producer and its conquest gives America a vast base from which to dominate the Middle East. It's been a conquest achieved at any price, including truth. It was serious dishonesty, the result of which uh, includes the fact that thousands of Iraqis have died. Hundreds of soldiers of, from our own countries have tragically died. Andrew Wilkie is the only serving Western intelligence officer to break cover and expose what he believes to be the truth about the invasion of Iraq. Working in the top secret Office of National Assessments in Canberra, he saw intelligence shared by America, Britain and Australia. We were sold this war on the basis of Iraq possessing a massive arsenal of weapons of mass destruction, which was never found and won't be found because there, there was no massive arsenal of weapons. We were also promised a need for a war on the basis of active cooperation between Iraq and Al-Qaeda and the fact that it was just a matter of time before some of these weapons from this massive arsenal were passed to this terrorist group. Always a ridiculous proposition and always completely at odds with my experience in the intelligence community that there was no hard intelligence to establish that there was a link between Iraq and Al-Qaeda. You know, I never saw any evidence that would link it and thus far there's been no evidence produced that would suggest that Saddam was behind Al-Qaeda. In fact, my experience in the time I served would suggest the opposite, that Saddam was the least likely person to want anything to do with Al-Qaeda. The only reason to have gone to war was to deal with a threat so imminent and so dangerous that war as a last resort was the only means available. As I weighed the evidence, as I watched the debate emerge, as I reflected on my own experiences, I listened to the discussions from the Pentagon and inside the White House, as I checked with sources in Congress and people who were current on the intelligence, that simply wasn't the case. 
Isn't there a problem for us in the West of honesty about the reason for going to war in Iraq, and that was weapons of mass destruction? Uh, I, I don't think that was a lie. We, we went to war in large part because of the concern that weapons of mass destruction in the, in the hands of the Saddam Hussein regime, a regime that used such weapons, uh, in particular nerve gas... And was supplied by the United States and Britain with these weapons of mass destruction. No, I don't believe that's accurate. Well, yes, they were. Most, most of the weapons of mass destruction from Saddam Hussein weren't built by him. The, uh, the machine tools and the, the ingredients for his biological weapons, they all came from other countries, many of them from this country and Britain. I don't think that's right. I think, I really think that well, the, the... It's on the you, record, you, uh, well, in the I, Library of Congress. I, 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 I think that, I, I think the premise of your question is wrong. Mr. Fife had only to look up this congressional record of a U.S. Senate inquiry in 1992. It shows that the U.S. government approved the sale of biological weapons to Saddam Hussein. The suppliers were this company in Maryland and Porton Down in Britain. If you really want to know the truth about the state of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction before the invasion, listen to Colin Powell in February 2001. He states clearly that there was no threat from Saddam Hussein. He has not developed any significant capability with respect to weapons of mass destruction. He is unable to project conventional power against his neighbors. And this is Condoleezza Rice, Bush's national security advisor, in July of the same year, saying the same thing, putting the lie to their own propaganda. Uh, we are able to keep arms from him. His military forces have not been rebuilt. And that, many believe, was the truth, a truth that was covered up and conveniently forgotten after September the 11th, when Bush and Blair decided to attack Iraq. They found no weapons of mass destruction, no links with Al-Qaeda, no nuclear weapons, no 45-minute threat. So was it all a charade? Uh, it was 95% charade, charade. A charade indeed. The invasion had been planned long ago. In July last year, Condoleezza Rice told another Bush official that decision has been made. Don't waste your breath. This is not what Bush told the American people. It's this that makes the inquiry in London by Lord Hutton look like a dramatic diversion. It's narrow terms preventing a far-reaching investigation, not only into the loss of one life, but thousands of lives of innocent people in Iraq, the victims of an unprovoked war. It's now reliably estimated that up to 10,000 civilians may have died in the attack on Iraq. Joe Wilding, a human rights observer in Baghdad during the bombing, saw the suffering. I and a few other observers were being taken around the hospital by one of the doctors and he was introducing us to some civilian casualties from the previous day. And he was called away to the emergency room. So he took us with him and as we walked in there was a woman probably in her mid-thirties, just screaming over and over, we're farmers, we're farmers. And she had a little boy in her arms. Um, he was four, his name was Mohammed. And the whole right-hand side of his face was cut up by shrapnel. And then there were other women in there. There was a little girl, and she was just screaming every time anyone moved her, screaming when they took her into the x-ray room, screaming when they brought her out again. And the doctor pulled back the covers and showed us this huge gouge out of her thigh and they were trying to clean it and they didn't have enough anaesthetics or painkillers or anything so she was just screaming and screaming as they tried to clean this wound all of them were just in so much pain and then Fatea, the youngest of the daughters, was eight and she was killed in the bombing and Fadma was just stained with all their blood and just going from one to another picking them up Why is it wrong for dictators and terrorists to kill innocent civilians and right or excusable for the United States to do exactly the same. 
Well, the United States doesn't do it, and if we did it, it would be as reprehensible as uh, as what the the terrorists do. You, the United States doesn't kill innocent civilians. Uh, no, the United States does not target civilians. Mm. Those of us on the outside who look at September the 11th, where 3,000 people died in that tragedy, but then look at the thousands who have died since, wonder about double standards here. Uh, would you address uh, that? I, I think that the um, uh, I think that the numbers that you're talking about are uh, are questionable. So let's let's leave aside what, what, your your, what, your numbers. Why, why but, are they questionable? Uh, I, I mean, I don't accept your assertion that we've killed thousands of uh, uh, of innocent people. But uh, let uh, me get there's to a, the there's a lot there's a lot of there's a lot of studies. Uh, and an examination of, of facts on the ground that suggest indeed thousands. I mean, in Iraq at the moment, uh, there are studies that are talking about 10,000, but I don't want to get into numbers, but certainly thousands seems a fair figure. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know that that's true, and I, and I don't accept the assertion. If you ask an American student how many people died in Vietnam, he'll tell you 58,000 because they've dismissed the two, three, maybe four million Vietnamese who were killed by the United States and its allies in that war. So this is an ongoing issue. Mr. Powell, Colin Powell, General Colin Powell, I think was quoted as having said, he's not interested in civilian casualties in Afghanistan. It's not his concern. And that's the attitude, I think, with Iraq. Whether it's 5,000 or 10,000, it's really not an issue. Well, I think Americans, like most people, are mostly concerned about their own countrymen. I don't know how many Iraqi civilians were killed, but I can assure you that the number is the absolute uh, minimal that it's possible uh, in modern warfare. One of the stunning things about the quick coalition victory was how little damage was done to Iraqi infrastructure uh, and how low Iraqi casualties were. And I think well, that's, that's quite high if it's 10,000 civilians. Well, I think it's quite low if you look at the size of the that military operation was undertaken. It's practically an inevitability in war that there are going to be uh, innocent people who get hurt no matter how much care a professional military, a properly behaved military, uh, puts into avoiding damage to non-combatants and to uh, civilian infrastructure. Mr. Fyfe, that sounds fine sitting here in Washington. But <clears throat> in Iraq and in Afghanistan, which is my most recent experience, that's not how it looks at all. May I interrupt for a moment? I apologize, sir. May, oh. Would you stop tape, please, for one moment? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Let excuse me know when you stop tape. Excuse me. I'm yeah. sorry I'm doing this purpose, please, sir. Have we stopped tape? Yeah, very serious. I was not under the impression, <clears throat> sir. Mr. Fife's minder, an army colonel, suddenly stopped the interview as I had pursued the question of civilian deaths. I agree. Over at the State Department, Under Secretary John Bolton concluded his interview with his own insight into my line of questions. One of our major objectives today is to put the government of Iraq back in the hands of Iraqi people so that they can enjoy the benefits of their country's resources and so that American soldiers can come home as soon as possible. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Okay. Appreciate it. So are you a no. Labour Party member? <laughs> well, Labour Party, they're the Conservatives in our So you're, you're a Communist Party member? The American media played a vital role in the invasion and the deception. Instead of challenging the propaganda, it echoed and amplified it. Well, I believe if the media had been more aggressive, um, and more tenacious towards getting the truth, uh, there's a very, very good chance we would not have gone to war in Iraq. It's pretty clear to me. But there is a fear and paranoia by journalists who realize they can't always report everything they know and that their editors will not... They, their, their job, in the middle of the uh, Iraq war, it was not to show some of the foibles and the uh, deceit of the White House. That was not your job. Your job was to be embedded, uh, which is a wonderful, wonderful word, which is obviously a metaphor for, for what's happened with the American media uh, covering wars going back decades, ever since Vietnam. And if you study every conflict since, you'll see how the Pentagon and, and the political types have outmaneuvered the media. And the media has allowed it to happen. 
Uh, they show up, they do what they're told, and they tell the story that certain people want them to tell. And that's what we call, quote unquote, news. I would go on television in the United States, and Fox News and, and the CS, CNBC and the like, and I would talk about the importance of applying you know, the Geneva Conventions and how, in fact, the Geneva Conventions protect uh, everybody. They protect American soldiers just like they protect, uh, you know, they protect the good guys just like they protect the bad guys. And, and I'm treated like, uh, you know, like a traitor, like, a, like, like uh, you know, like I'm committing treason. We have a perpetual war which gives the incumbent sitting president over there in the Oval Office a 10 to 15 point bounce on all public opinion. He is a wartime president, even though actually we're not at war. Uh, <laughs> there's something really weird here. The truth, fact is fiction, fiction is fact, war is peace, peace is war. What the hell's going on here? I mean, Mr. Bush has very cleverly manipulated the fear, the anxiety, that 9-11 sprang upon the people of New York and ultimately the entire country. And every time he wants to jack up his ratings, he simply stirs up the fear pot uh, by upgrading the level of impending danger without any specifics, of course. I think it's just, it's a, it's a very ugly game that's being played on the Americans. There's something so similar between our administration and Al-Qaeda in its certainty that God is on its side, that is laughable. And that the American people should fall for this line hurts me more than I can tell you. Norman Mailer wrote the other day that um, he believed that America had entered a pre-fascist state. What's your view of that? Well, in a way, and I'm not saying this to be cynical, but I hope he's right, because there are others that are saying we are already in a fascist sort of mode. If you say something often enough, the people will begin to believe it. And uh, that strategy uh, has been applied with, unfortunately, great success by this administration. Weapons of mass destruction, Al-Qaeda, Iraq ties, other evidence being adduced to justify an unprovoked war. And so, yeah, I think we ought to all be worried about fascism. I think the rest of us should be extremely concerned. We've seen uh, total disregard for the United Nations, the United Nations Charter and its fundamental uh, concepts. We've seen rejection of international law uh, and the respect for sovereignty uh, of other countries. We've seen uh, a preemptive strike against a sovereign state which is outrageous in concept and dangerous in consequence and something we should all worry about. And every country that now is threatened by Mr. Bush, which is his habit, whether it's Iran or North Korea or Syria or Libya or others, it's an outrage that we should stand by and allow these countries to be threatened by a man so dangerous that he's willing to sacrifice American lives and worse, the lives of others whether they're Iraqis or Afghanis, or possibly Syrians and others, in some mad aggression. Aggression was at the core of the judgment at the Nuremberg trial of the German leadership following World War II. The judges decided that unprovoked aggression was the supreme international war crime which contained all the evils of other war crimes. Blair and Bush have found ways of justifying, of course, the wars, both against Afghanistan and against um, Iraq, in terms of particular circumstances or the violation of particular um, requirements. Uh, but it seems to me that, that, that these wars um, are um, indeed acts of aggression, as defined at Nuremberg um, and in previous agreements, and that... Uh, in, in a sense, both Bush and Blair are guilty and could stand in the dock, accused of waging aggressive war. The United Nations was founded so that we would never forget the crimes of great power. Are we now in danger of forgetting? Do we forget the lies that justified the conquest of Iraq and disguised America's plans to dominate all the world? 
Do we forget that the British government has announced for the first time that it's prepared to launch an attack with nuclear weapons echoing yet again George Bush? And do we accept a distortion of intellect and morality that empties noble words like democracy and liberation of their true meaning, that says it's wrong for a terrorist to kill innocent people, but right for governments to commit the same crimes in our name? The answer is that we need not accept any of this if we recognize that there are now two superpowers. One is the regime in Washington, the other is public opinion, now stirring all over the world, perhaps as never before. Make no mistake, it's an epic struggle. The alternative is not just the conquest of faraway countries, it's the conquest of us, of our minds, our humanity, and our self-respect. If we remain silent, victory over us is assured.